come learn about scoliosis curve types. When a patient receives a diagnosis of scoliosis, we have to understand that all scoliosis curvatures are the same, so receiving a very general diagnosis of scoliosis isn't really enough to tell you what type of scoliosis, is it treatable, can it be helped? And we know there are many different types of scoliosis. There are different types based upon causation. The majority of scoliosis cases are diagnosed as idiopathic, meaning unknown cause. It means we have no idea why the patient is developing scoliosis. Something happened during either growth or, or adult stage to actually cause the scoliosis to start to occur. However, that's only about 80% of all cases. Another 20% actually have a known cause. One uh, another type is something called neuromuscular, and this is when a patient has a neuromuscular condition, something like cerebral palsy, Marfan's, Ehlers Downer syndrome, neurofibromatosis, which is a, a soft tissue connective tissue neurological disorder that affects normally either the elasticity or the stiffness of those tissues, which can lead to the causation of scoliosis. Another type is degenerative scoliosis, and this is when the spine degenerates in a certain area, and that degenerative uh, area, meaning the discs or the bones going through a degenerative phase can cause a curvature to occur. And this is normally in the adult stage, and it, another name for degenerative scoliosis is something called de novo scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis is a third type of scoliosis that's not idiopathic, and that's when a patient is born with a, a, a malformed bone within the spine called a hemivertebra. The vertebra is shaped like a triangle as opposed to a rectangle. This triangle stacked in between all the spinal vertebra, which are rectangles, will cause a curvature at that type. And then another type is also called traumatic. Traumatic scoliosis is when you go through a trauma that causes some type of shifting in the spine, which will cause a scoliosis to start to occur at that time. All of these are, have known causes, but however, 80% of these other cases, meaning idiopathic cases, don't have a known cause. And it's, it's very um, clear that we believe scoliosis is a multifactorial condition. You notice I didn't say genetic cause because we don't really know how much genetics plays a factor into scoliosis, meaning genetic being a type of scoliosis. The only truly genetic type is congenital because you're born that way. It's something that mutated or developed during development. Um, however, when we look at idiopathic, we think there's many, many, many causes. So I'm only naming the ones that we know. It, it, the definition of idiopathic means unknown. However, when we look at scoliosis, we have to classify it, and we normally classify scoliosis based upon some key patient conditions and variables. First thing is age. We look at the patient's age. Is the patient uh, infantile scoliosis? Is it a juvenile scoliosis, adolescent, adult, or late stage, um, late stage adult? Infantile scoliosis are patients between zero and two. Juvenile are between two and eight and 10, somewhere around that age. Um, adolescent scoliosis is normally between 10 and 18. And adult scoliosis is anything above 18 um, and the adult stage. The type of condition, meaning the ones I mentioned above, is it idiopathic scoliosis? Is it a neuromuscular scoliosis? Is it a traumatic scoliosis? Severity is the size of curve, meaning is it a mild scoliosis between 10 and 25 degrees? Is it over 25 to 40, which is they call that moderate? Anything over 40 is considered severe. And then 80 degrees plus is something I call very severe or super severe scoliosis. And of course, curve location and type whether it's an S-curve or whether it's in the thoracic spine or cervical spine. When we look at different sections of the spine, we know that the sections of the spines are divided into, th into three main areas, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. So when we look at the curve type, is it a cervical scoliosis? Is it a thoracic scoliosis? Is it a lumbar scoliosis? Thoracic scoliosis are the most commonly diagnosed, but scoliosis can develop anywhere in the person's spine, and sometimes it can cover two regions, meaning you can have a thoracolumbar area that's kind of like in between the two areas, and it'll be actually called a thoracolumbar scoliosis. Each section of the curve is really dependent upon every other section. So most people will not just have one curve. They're gonna have multiple curves throughout their spine. Everybody will have three or more curves, um, and I've seen as many as 12 curves in a patient's spine from skull to pelvis. We have lots of little curves. We can have one, um, one relatively large curve with two smaller ones. However, there tends to be always more than one. Three or more is the most common is what we tend to see. The curve location, meaning cervical, thoracic, or lumbar, makes curves different, but also is gonna be the size of curve, meaning the severity, like I mentioned, whether it's a mild thoracic curve, moderate thoracic curve, or severe thoracic curves. Now we also know curves have a specific tendency at which they bend. 
lumbar curves normally go to the left, meaning a left lumbar. Thoracic curves normally go to the right, where we have a right thoracic. Sometimes curve can bend in the opposite direction, and this is normally called an atypical case. Typical idiopathic scoliosis cases are left lumbar, right thoracic. Atypical cases are right lumbar, left thoracic. This left thoracic scoliosis is unfortunately can be an indicator of an underlying pathology. Some of the other things I mentioned before, like a neuromuscular problem, some kind of spinal cord issue, some kind of traumatic causation, some type of congenital hemivertebra, something like that going on is more common with these types of scoliosis than just plain old idiopathic scoliosis because most the spine or the body will normally take the spine away from the heart in an idiopathic case, meaning they'll make the spine go to the right in the thoracic spine, not to the left. Other curve differences can be on how the spine actually bends, meaning if it's on the convex or concave side. We always know concave sides are on the inside of the curve and convex sides are on the outside of the curve. Normally when we're looking at concave and convex sides, we know the spine typically will rotate into the concave side. So an, away from the way it's being named. So if you have a right thoracic scoliosis, you normally have left thoracic rotation. And that's how these concave and convex sides come into play on the outer edge or the inner edge of, uh, of the curvature. So we know most of the time the spine will rotate into the convex on concave side. If we ever see the spine rotate to the convex side or weight rotate to the side it's curving to, that's considered an abnormal finding as well. It's considered atypical, and that could be another sign of some type of underlying pathology or some other type of concern. When we look at curvatures, whether they're being typical or atypical, we know that mo all scoliosis curves need treatment because unfortunately they're progressive over time. The good thing about Scoliosis Reduction Center and the treatment that we provide here is that our treatments look to reduce the size of curve and they're conservative in nature, meaning they're gonna normally, most of these curves can be treated that I mentioned and mostly we're looking at the conservative treatment to be very non-invasive and have a very positive effect on the person's body and function and well-being. So conservative treatment can always be a first line of, of treatment as opposed to just watching and waiting to see if your curve worsens, to see if it causes more problems, and to see at some point in the future that you may need some type of invasive surgery. If you have scoliosis and it's already been categorized, we definitely recommend that you seek proactive treatment to protect your body and your spine from having all the negative effects of scoliosis progression over your lifetime. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.